not wired for failure. That's not. However, failure is part of every life. I think we fail our way to success, if you want to know the truth. Maybe what you want, maybe what you think you want could be the worst thing in the world for you, and you just don't even know that yet. The prodigal son thought he knew what he wanted, too. I want my part of the inheritance. I want to go out and do my own thing and live my own life. And his father gave it to him. It always amazes me that he just gave it to him. No argument. He gave it to him. He knew he was going to go out and waste it and make a mess out of his life, but he gave it to him anyway. Because sometimes the only way that we can learn what we don't want is by having it. Some of you single people so antsy to get married, you're liable to marry the wrong person. Honey, you have never had misery. You think being single is bad? Oh, that is not bad. What's bad is being married to the wrong person. That's what's bad. So I'm just asking you today, whatever it is you think you want, what if you never got it? <laughs> Would you love God just as much anyway? Yeah. See, I think something that we don't really fully understand is how much we seek God for what he can do for us when we really should be seeking God for who he is how much fear do you have in your life that you're not going to get what you want and if you don't can you be happy anyway can you still be a blessing to other people can you still be a real Christian? And can, can you love God just as much, no matter what He wants you to do or where you're at? Can, can we do that? Amen? All right. The second fear that I believe that many people deal with is the fear of failure, which is really the fear of imperfection. Now, people that have a more perfectionistic personality have real problems with this. But we all have problems with it to a certain degree. So for a lot of different reasons, people just, we're not wired for failure. That's not, however, failure is part of every life. I think we fail our way to success, if you want to know the truth. First of all, nobody's a failure until you stop trying. That's the only thing that labels you as a failure. As long as you keep moving and getting up and trying again, the righteous man falls seven times and rises again. You can knock me down, but you can't knock me out. Amen? If I don't have any other testimony, I have this one. I'm still here. Amen. Failure doesn't always mean you're going backwards. Sometimes we learn more by our failures than we do by our successes. And even failure is never a failure if you're willing to learn from it and not make that mistake again. In Matthew chapter 14, we see an example of Jesus coming to the disciples, walking on the water. And there were 12 disciples in the boat. Only one had the courage to step out on the water. And even he got afraid in a short period of time and began to sink. Well, Jesus didn't just cast all those 12 men aside and say, I can't work with you. You're all a bunch of cowards. <laughs> Thank God he keeps working with us, and he keeps working with us, and he keeps working with us. However, I do want to say this. I believe one of the reasons, even though Peter had a lot of problems in his personality, fear being one of them, I do believe that one of the reasons why God was able to use Peter in such an astounding way, and it is astounding when you consider that Peter rebuked Jesus. And denied Christ three times. And yet he became one of the main apostles. And I believe one of the reasons why God was able to work with Peter was because even though Peter had some fears, he did at least get out of the boat. Some people won't even do that. They won't ever even try to do anything. They're so afraid that they're going to fail that they won't even try. 
people stay in boring lifestyles and boring jobs and they keep their same old boring friends. <laughs> Same old, same old, same old, same, same. Well, God, I don't understand. I need something fresh and new. Why do we do that? Because we feel safe with sameness. And yet, there's a part of us that despises it. There's a part of you that's crying out to get out of the boat. But then the devil says, well, what if you drown? <laughs> I'd almost rather do that anymore than to stay the same. Yeah. Nothing is more frightening than never changing. Yeah. Amen? Don't be afraid of failure. Third fear that I think we deal with is fear that we're not doing enough. We actually took a survey at our ministry, and I forget now what all the questions were, but we wanted to know what kind of teaching that they felt like that people needed the most. And do you know what one, that the top number one answer was? We want to know when we're doing enough for God. You ever have that little phrase going around in your head, God, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? <laughs> and what God wants you to do is. <laughs> and you know, believing is not really a passive thing. Really believing God is a very active thing, but you're spiritually active rather than running around in the flesh making a mess out of everything because you're doing a bunch of stuff that God's not in. What does it mean to get in the flesh? It means you're trying to do what only God can do, and He's just got to stand back and watch you make a mess out of it over and over and over and over and over and over until you finally get it. I can't do this. We go to God, we're so funny. Oh, God. <laughs> God, I just can't do this. I just can't do this. Like we're telling him something he didn't already know and has tried to tell us five million times. <laughs> what, what, what do you want me to do? God, just tell me I've done everything I know how to do, God. I guess there's just nothing left to do but pray. <laughs> Aren't we hysterical? <laughs> one day I was having one of my tantrums and I fell down on the floor very dramatically and I said, that's it, God, I just, I quit. <laughs> I just, I give up. And you know what the Holy Ghost said back to me? Really? I heard, it, and I thought, well, you sound excited that I'm giving up. <laughs> and this, this was what came to my heart. Well, that's the only time I get to work. <laughs> the few times when you're exhausted enough that you'll lay down your works of the flesh. Man, I was trying so hard. I was trying to change Dave. <laughs> oh, I was trying to change him, and he just wouldn't change. And God wouldn't help me, and I didn't like that at all. <laughs> God kept telling me to change, and I kept wanting him to redirect his attention toward Dave. <laughs> Come on, is anybody home in the house today? <laughs> oh my gosh, I remember those days, and I know some of you are in those days now. My oldest son, David, was just like me, and we couldn't even be in the room together for two seconds. And I didn't realize it was because he was like me that I couldn't get along with him. Because <laughs> you see, I was still back there. I didn't even like myself yet. So how could I have liked him? Because he was just like me. <laughs> Hello. I'm talking to somebody. Is anybody home in the house today? I'm just remembering now a little bit of the frustration that I felt. 
trying to change Dave, trying to change myself. I didn't care for my next door neighbor. I was working on her when I had time. <laughs> Come on, who all are you working on right now in your life? Well, guess what? God is not going to help you do that because He wants to work on you. And not only that, some of those people, He has planted them in your life as sandpaper. We'll talk more about that in another one of these enjoyable messages that we're having this weekend. One of the things we need to do is give up counting everything. How long did I pray? How much did I read? <laughs> Have I done enough? Have I done enough? Have I done enough? Pastor asked me this morning if I was happy with the crowd last night. I said, yeah. I said, I gave that up a long time ago. I used to drive myself nuts counting the people in my meetings. You know why? Because I felt like my own personal success was dictated by how many people were there. And I can remember when, you know, just to get 75 people in a room was like a great success for me. You know, the point is, is if we base things on that, enough is never enough. It's never enough. Enough is never enough. Because as long as you're on that system, the devil's going to up the ante and say, well, now you can't be happy if you don't have this. Some of you right now have more financial success than you would have ever thought you would have ever had in your whole life, and you still ain't satisfied. You got a bigger house than you ever thought you'd have. Your house is bigger than your grandma's, your grandpa's, your great grandma's, your mom's, and now you just want a bigger one. I got the wrong side of the room. Okay, I'll go over here. Now you want more square footage to moan about and gripe about when you got to clean it. When you're counting things and measuring your success by what everybody around you has, and it, I mean, it gets, it gets into ministry. I've seen preachers like they're all in competition over who's got the biggest church. And he, I mean, we moved into the inner city of St. Louis to start a church to the, we, the poorest, worst neighborhood that we could find. And we had churches get mad at us. Well, we don't need one of these big ministries coming in here to steal our people. <laughs> That's the church. I mean, if we're going to have to fight over sinners, we really got a problem. <laughs> and then poor sinners at that. <laughs> oh, well, I remember when I used to count how long I prayed. And an intercessor came to our church one time, and she talked about how she prayed four hours a day from five to nine. And she seemed like she really had the power of God on her life, so I thought, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. See, we think if we can just find out what somebody else is doing and do that, then we're going to have what they have. And, you know, there's a certain truth to, you know, the Elisha, Elijah principle. If you want to be a great man or woman of God, don't follow some dunce around all the time. <laughs> if you want to be a positive person, don't hang out with a bunch of negative people. The people we're around do influence us. But... Just because God anoints something for one person, that doesn't mean he's going to anoint it for you. My daughter just lost 50 pounds, and another woman that works for me just lost about 60 pounds. And as soon as anybody hears that, the first thing they say is, what did you do? What did you do? The thing that people don't realize is you need to go to God and get your own plan. Well, she, she was anointed to pray four hours a day. I wasn't. But I tried to do it. I took my clock, went in a room, took my Bible, made a big announcement of it to my family. From now on, every morning, from 5 to 9, I will be in the prayer room. I mean, I was probably starting to sprout wings out my back already. Well, I prayed in there five minutes, and I'd already prayed about everything I knew to pray about three times. 
And then I had a holy nap. How many of you know what a holy nap is? Well, I wasn't about to tell my family I went in there and fell asleep. Well, God wasn't going to help me do that. I had the same experience when I tried to read the Bible through in a year, and I think that's a good thing to do. But I just, you know, I'm a teacher, and I start reading something, and then next thing I know, I'm running all through the Bible and going all over the place, and I just, for me, I have a hard time just chronologically starting in Genesis. I mean, I get to Leviticus, and I know God had a purpose, but... I mean, I can only do so many begets. And God knows me. He knows how I'm put together. And I'm not trying to be flippant. I think having a plan is a good thing. But I am trying to tell you, when you try to get somebody else's plan, thinking if you do their plan, you're going to have what they have and be what they are, it ain't going to work for you. Because God wants you going to Him to get His plan for your life. We have way too many formulas that we try to follow as Christians. Amen? Amen? Stop counting everything. How good have I been? How many mistakes have I made? You know, David numbered Israel to see how many men he had because he wanted to feel good about the next battle he went into. And God released a plague. He was offended because David was counting up the men to see if he had what it took to win the battle. God wanted him to know you got what it takes because you got me. And God wants you to know that you've got what it takes because you've got him. You don't have to be like somebody else. You don't have to do it the way somebody else does it. You are a unique individual and God wants you to be you. The fear of man is another big fear that we have. My goodness. If God is on my side, what can man do to me? Why are we so addicted to everybody else's approval? We go get a different haircut, and the only thing we're looking for is to see if people are going, oh. <laughs> but if they go... You know what it means when somebody says, hmm, that's unique. <laughs> Acts 5.29 says, we must obey God rather than man. Paul said in Galatians 1.10, if I were trying to be popular with people, I wouldn't now be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Wow. Double Wow. And I can stand here and tell you, if I would have been trying to be popular, which I desperately wanted, if I would have been trying to be popular back in the day when God first called me to do this, I would have walked away from the call on my life and I would have chosen to be popular in the group and I would not be standing here today. Satan steals people's destiny because they want everybody's approval. And God does call some to get out of the boat and be the first one to do a thing. Amen. Let's look at John 12, 42 and 43. I want to put those up on the screen. I want you to see the seriousness of this. Some people don't even go on with God. They don't even go to deeper levels in God. They just keep playing church all their life. And they never get really committed to God. Because, you know, if you become a radical Christian and your friends don't want to be a full-on Christian, then they're going to put you out of the group. Well, now you just think you're holier than thou. You just think you're better than us. I remember when my, a group of my girlfriends after God called me to do this, and I just started wanting to stay home and study, and I was praying, and I wasn't trying to be spiritual. I was just trying to seek God and learn something. 
And a lot of other things just lost interest for me. I just didn't want to do some of the things that I did before. And it was a genuine call on my life. And I remember some of my friends coming to me, and they were serious. They said, Joyce, we are concerned about you. You're just getting a little overboard with this religious thing. And they were all Christians. And they were concerned for me because I was trying to do what I felt like God wanted me to do. We lost friends. We were ostracized by family members. If you do anything very different than what everybody else is doing, they ain't going to like it. Come on. I said, if you do anything very different than what everybody else is doing, they're not going to like it. Okay, look at these scriptures, verse 42, John 12, 42. And yet in spite of all this, many of the leading men, the authorities and the nobles, believed and trusted in him. But because of the Pharisees, they wouldn't confess it for fear that if they would acknowledge him, they would be expelled from the synagogue. For they loved the approval and the praise and the glory that comes from men instead of and more than the glory that comes from God. They valued their credit with men more than their credit with God. Isn't that amazing? People who want to, people who wanted to believe in Jesus, but because it wasn't popular, they turned away from God and kept people happy. You have to be very careful that you don't let the fear of man rule and control you. There's all kinds of fears. I mean, I've got, I just now almost finished last night's message. We don't even, we haven't touched this morning's yet. But, <laughs> don't worry, I've only got about seven minutes left. There's the fear of lack, the fear of loneliness, the fear of rejection, the fear of abandonment, the fear of death. The fear of being wrong. <laughs> What's so terrible about saying, I was wrong? Let, let's see you try it. Say, I was wrong. Don't mumble it. Say it. <laughs> I was wrong. You know, being right is highly overrated. It's amazing the fuss we make just to be right. And you know the reason why we do? Anybody who really knows true righteousness, you don't have to do that nonsense. You don't have to try to prove to other people you're right because you already know you're right with God and you know that if you need to be proven to be in the right, that God is your vindicator and he'll work it out. How about the fear of trouble? Trials, tribulations. I love in John chapter 4 when Jesus got in the boat with the disciples and he said, now just get this, let us cross over to the other side. Okay, now he said where they were going. Let us cross over to the other side. How many of you believe that God has said something to you in your life about some direction for your future? And what do you have now? Probably a storm. Because the next thing they got was a storm of hurricane proportions. And not only did they get a storm, Jesus was asleep in the bottom of the boat. <laughs> How do you like that for encouragement? <laughs> well, I thought we were going to the other side. And now this storm is going to kill us. And they went and woke him up. Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? And he rebuked them for fear. And sure enough, a few verses later, they showed up on the other side. You know, God is going to get you to the other side. Well, there are many different kinds of fear that can keep people from accomplishing all that God intends for their lives, but it doesn't have to be that way. If we learn to keep our eyes on God instead of our fears, we'll be able to do all that God has called us to do. He loves us, and His love guarantees us that we can be confident to press forward to take action and not to have to draw back in fear.